Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here doing another live event brought to you by Guide and Grow and Guide and Grow TV. And today we are going to talk about an amazing topic, Montessori to support neurodivergent children. And I have a very special guest joining me today. Before I begin, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I am from, the Darug people, and pay my respects to the elders past present and future as they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia. Um, So as you guys know, at the end of every month, we have an expert to discuss some amazing work that they're doing in a really important topic about raising children and um, obviously to do with Montessori as well. These events are free across all our platforms. So right now, let us know where are you listening in from? Are you on our YouTube channel? Are you on Facebook? Let us know what country you're listening in from. And the best thing about these live events that we do is that at any time, you guys can ask questions live on air. We'll pop them up on the screen and we'll be able to answer all those important questions that you have. So if you're joining us from our YouTube channel, Guide and Grow TV, or in our Facebook group, Montessori at Home, zero to three years, I welcome you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days. I know how busy everyone is in their schedule and to really come here to want to learn about a particular topic. Um, It's amazing. And I'm super excited today to introduce to you all, we have uh, Facebook from US, that's awesome, um, to introduce to you all Dr. Daniela Boyd. And I'm just going to bring her on the screen and read a little bio. Hi, Daniela. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we are going to be discussing the topic of Montessori to support neurodivergent children today. And I really, I just wanted to read out a bio before we begin. So Daniela is a Montessori-inspired mum of two boys. She is a doctor in uh, education and specialises in sensory play and input, supporting her child's augmentative and alternative communication and speech development, working with multilingual students and students with disabilities. Um, For everybody who's watching out there and is going to replay, hashtag replay, let us know where you're listening in from. We have another Facebook user from the US. Um, The best thing about these live events is that we have people from all around the world joining us. Um, Daniela, let everyone know where you're from, a little bit about you and what got you interested in this particular topic. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. So Sylvia knows this, um, but I'm a little under the weather today. My kids got sick and we just moved a week ago. So Uh, I've been a resident of Georgia in the United States for a week, um, originally coming from South Florida. So the weather change has been a little bit drastic. It's very warm down there. And here we've had some like really cold days and some not like some warm days. So it's been a little bit of a mix. Um, I am a first generation American. Uh, My parents are from Ecuador. My entire family on both sides is from Ecuador and South America. Um, So I am a parent in a bicultural, bilingual, um, and biracial household. So that's kind of a little bit about about me right now. Yeah, amazing. And um, tell us about your background and how you got involved in Montessori education. Sure. So I I have been an educator for over 11 years. Um, I have my uh, master's in education, my doctorate um, in education and curriculum and instruction. So I'm particularly interested in methods of instruction uh, for children, especially that are child-centered, child-led. Um, I had learned a bit about Montessori in my um, my master's program, like a brief bit, you know, covering curriculum and, and how curriculum has developed and, and same thing in my doctorate program. But what really piqued my interest was um, when my, my eldest son, who is now four years old, was flagged for developmental delays. And at 16 months, he entered what we call in, in the United States, and particularly in my state of Florida, early intervention. Um, so he was referred by the pediatrician due to um, missing milestones, um, mainly fine motor, some gross motor, and um, significant what they called significant delays um, in speech language development. Um, and the options that were given to me for therapy didn't sit well with me. 
Um, we went through a few therapists until we were finally matched with our developmental specialist, who is a neuropsychologist who recommended a more child-centered, child-led approach. And I was completely mind blown. I was like, yes, this is it. Um, and she was the one who recommended that we look more into um, doing Montessori at home. Mm. I began to connect all the dots with what I had been learning. Um, I was currently working on my doctorate and then what I had learned in my master's program and dove deep into it at that point. Um, so that's kind of what got my start into um, practicing Montessori at home, even though I had heard about it, learned about it. What really piqued my interest was when we were going through it with my own child. Yeah, I think that's really incredible. And you mentioned how you only touched on it in your master's. And I actually found the same thing here in Australia, even through a postgraduate like degree in the master's of teaching and education, it was only briefly kind of mentioned as like a type of theory or philosophy. And it's I feel like it needs to be more generally like taught as well, because the benefits as we see, and we're going to dive into that, especially for neurodivergent children, but even for typically developing children as well, like how supportive it is of a curriculum. And I take my hat off to you for finding something that you that sat well with you because you weren't happy with what was out there. And, and I think that goes across all like globally when we look at the therapy that's available for children. Like we know that the Montessori method and it started as a as an inclusive education and the possibilities are so much and I'm really excited to go into this topic with you um can you tell me like from your experience you know with your own child and using Montessori at home what do you think like how does it cater to say the strengths of neurodiverse children what are some of the things that you saw that really helped you um on your journey for me, I think the biggest thing was that um, Montessori principles believe that we must honor a child's pace and honor where they are developmentally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when when you're being told your child needs to do this type of therapy or that they're behind or they're fit, like I would hear your child's in the fifth percentile of development. And when you hear that, like it just, it sounds awful. And no one was putting it into context for me. No one was explaining what that meant or that this is for insurance so we can get this therapy mm -hmm. or what, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think letting go of that, right. And, and truly embracing like he is where he is meant to be. And that falls in line with Montessori principles. And I think that that's really one of the most important things that us as the prepared adult needs to like embrace and just go with it. Because mm. when we believe that, then we position our child to be the best that they can be, then we can meet their needs. We are not comparing them to someone else, comparing them to a standard that that really is for neurotypical children, right? Based off of neurotypical development. Yeah. Um, and it took so much pressure off of me to just be like, he's where he needs to be. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to, I'm going to meet those needs. Um, and so I think that that for me was the most important thing. Um, and also like honoring autonomy and choice. I feel like um, the ideas of assuming capacity are often taken away from um, mm -hmm. neurodivergent children, um, especially in therapies and, and what therapists might the advice they might be giving to parents or techniques that they might be using in therapy. And so um, I got told once by a therapist that I gave too much choice. And I was like, okay, we're finding another therapist because I think that it's important <laughs> for a child to know that they have choices. And that's part of, you know, us operating, you know, setting those limits and operating within those boundaries is mm. we set, we give them the choices that are within our capacity, within our limits, but they ultimately have autonomy and, and they, how can we expect our kids to grow up and advocate for themselves if we don't start somewhere with all children and especially neurodivergent children? Um, I also That's a really good point, uh, Daniela. I wanted to comment on that because two things. A lot of the times people will categorize and put children that are neurodiverse in that box and say, oh, well, you know, 
just because we allow, you know, neurotypical children to have those choices and autonomy, oh, no, this kind of therapy is what's needed. And, you know, why why is it any different, right? So when you when you say that it's all about that autonomy and giving them that choice and, and respecting them as people and human beings and capable, seeing them as capable, confident members, which is comes back to the principles of Montessori and what you were talking about, you know, how it values children and respects them for who they are and what they're capable of. I think that viewpoint is so important. I wanted to ask you, how did you shift your mindset? Because it's really hard when you say like, oh, it, you know, as soon as you recognize that and you've, as soon as you saw your child as you know, in that light, but it's really hard because parents out there, especially who have neurodivergent children might then have all of these expectations. They'll, you know, they'll be put into these categories and society actually doesn't help them to accept and, you know, and really see their child in, in the light that they should. What, you know, how did you go through that process or what advice could you give to people to, you know, to not to be disheartened with what, you know, what they're being told? Um. I, I, I do get this question a lot. I, I get a lot of people ask me like, well, you seem so, you seem so okay with, you know, your son's diagnosis and his process. Like, how did you get there? And um, obviously it takes, it takes work because there are a lot of, there's a lot of information coming your way. At first, I was a first time parent. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but also like you see other people's children and you see them doing these things and you begin to learn about monitoring. You're like, wow, like these kids are sitting down and doing shelf work and my child like won't sit down. Right. And so um, the first step was letting go of that comparison in honesty and being like, okay, like right now he's not sitting. Can we try standing? Can we try an activity moving around? Can we start with his interests, which at the time, like, and, and, a lot of people find this hard to believe, but when when we started implementing Montessori principles at home or like at, at the least learning about me preparing myself, my son's biggest interests were circular objects. That was the only thing that he was interested in. Yeah. And like he's four years old, he now will grab his shelf work. He will he will sit for a few minutes at a time. He needs his movement breaks, but we had to start somewhere. And so I think that was the next step was realizing, all right, we got to start somewhere. He's not there yet. He, it might take him a little bit longer. Mm. He's not going to act like the four-year-old kid of my friends or the other kid that I see on this person's Instagram or Facebook. Like it's, his journey is just going to look different. And so kind of ex accepting that you're going to have to start somewhere. You're going to start 10 seconds here, mm. make it 15 seconds next time. You know, like um, I think that, we as parents of neurodivergent kids um, are often given these goals by a lot of therapists too that put pressure on us as well. And I understand, you know, I understand as part of their job. And, you know, here in the United States, a lot of those goals are tied to insurance and, and you know, what they will pay for and how many sessions that they will cover. Mm -hmm. So like, I understand all of that. I really do. And, and but it's, it's also really difficult to be like, you know what? We're going to start here and advocate for your child. And I think that was the, the next step that I needed to realize is I don't have to be doing everything that I'm being told that I have to do for my child. I need to become an expert on my child. And so that's kind of where I started learning about um, like sensory input um, through our occupational therapists and, and taking courses and, and learning how to do set, like a, more sensory integration at home. I started rethinking how we were approaching speech and doing courses, courses on that and, and introducing um, an AAC device, which is an augmentative um, and alternative communication device. So it's an app that he has on an iPad. And I know that like in a lot of Montessori homes, it might be screen free and so forth. That's like, well, but it's his communication device, you know, and it's something that has allowed him to communicate his needs. And it was just kind of rethinking everything. And truly accepting, I have to be the expert in my child. I, I'm hearing all these things from professionals and that's great. I'm going to learn from them, but I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm, I'm going to put in the hard work so that I know how to advocate for my child and how to make these decisions for him um, as well until he can make them for himself. 
Yeah, that's incredible. I'm so grateful that you're sharing your experience. And I know that there are people that are listening out here that can totally relate to you. And, um, you know, taking that time to understand more about it and learn just like it is with anything else, you know, when you're learning about particular things that can help your child or, you know, and supporting them on their journey and seeing them for where they're at. I really, really love that because it totally ties into the Montessori philosophy, no matter where your child sits. So yeah, that's incredible. Um, I know that I stopped you before you were going to say another point. I don't know if you had anything else about um, on that first question about, you know, the strengths or the benefits that you've seen um, in, in your home particularly. Yeah. Um, one thing that is particularly great about Montessori is the materials focus on one skill at a time. And um, we don't realize how important this is, but when you have a child that can uh, feel overwhelmed by sensory input or by too many steps. Like, so um, my child, like many neurodivergent kids, he struggles with executive function. So anything that requires too many steps, um, they need to be broken down, um, things like that. And so when they have materials that do too much, it's very overwhelming. Like, where do you start? Too many pieces, too many functions. Like um, sometimes some toys do get labeled Montessori or they're put on best toys list, but they might not be the most helpful for working at a skill because they work on too much at a time. Mm -hmm. And so I found that to be so crucial um, for my child in particular, especially as we're building like his fine motor skills is to work on one skill at a time. And um, like Montessori materials allow us to do that. Um, and I end the, the self-correction as well, right? Um, makes him feel more independent, more in control. Like he knows, like I did it. Um, and I think that that's so crucial for every child, but especially for our, our neurodivergent kids that like that really need to just focus on, on one little thing at a time because that's, that's how their brain might, might be wired. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all about adjusting the environment to support your child, right? So if you do find that things, some things might be overwhelming or if you do find that you need to use technology in the home or whatever it is, these are the things that need to be adjusted and made so that you can truly support your child in the environment. And that comes back to the prepared environment. Yes. It comes back to the prepared adult, yes. you know, making sure that you're prepared for that space and that journey as well. And so it really ties into, um, you know, ties into the Montessori philosophy and what you're doing as well. Um, how do you specifically like tailor the Montessori curriculum or I guess the environment? I mean, I, I know that you mentioned about not having activities that have like too many processes, but is there anything that um, you could kind of talk about, especially in regards to that sensory needs of children? Yeah. I think that's a really important one because a lot of people are unsure about how to navigate those kind of activities or, or what to do. Sure. So um, firstly, I will say that it was really important for me when we first met with an occupational therapist to learn my son's sensory profile. So is he sensory seeking? Is he sensory avoidant? Because that will kind of determine um, what kind of sensory input you want to have or you explain for people who are listening, sure. Daniela, what the difference is between sensory seeking and sensory avoidance? Sure. So um, my son has like sensory seeking tendencies, meaning that there are certain behaviors or certain movements that he might repeat because he is um, under producing in that sense and he is seeking it to get to a certain level where he his body feels good. Yeah. And if he is sensory avoidant, then he is like over responsive and um, he might need a little bit less because that's where you start to get like aversions, like texture aversions and so forth. Yeah. So my son is sensory seeking in uh, what's called proprioception. Um, Montessori te terminology is like the heavy work, uh, that kind of like deep input. Um, so he likes to push things, climb, all of that. Um, he's also sensory seeking when it comes to the vestibular system. So he likes yeah. to do a lot of spinning, um, shaking of the head and so forth. He is also a visual sensory seeker. So he might um, look at things differently with his hands to see what that produces when he looks at a light or shadows and things like that. Um, he is 
sensory avoidant when it comes to certain textures. Um, mm -hmm. So this, for example, um, if you are doing the child led feeding or baby led weaning, whatever um, you call it, wherever you're from, um, that can be particularly difficult and challenging if your child has a sensory aversion to certain textures. And that was like our case, for example. Um, and it, uh, looking back, that was one that should have been one of my first signs very early on at six months that there were some sensory sensitivities there. Um, he didn't like anything on his hands. And so that, that, that baby led feeding was, it, it wasn't going anywhere, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then he had motor planning challenges. So even though the, doing this movement was, was difficult for spoon feeding. So there were some challenges there. Um, so I do think it's important to understand your child's sensory profile before deciding how you're gonna tailor your environment. So knowing that my child was sensory avoidant when it came to certain textures, we wanted to identify safe textures and see if there was a way to work towards um, becoming okay with certain textures. So like paint, he couldn't feel paint because it, it reminds the same thing as yeah. the spoon. Um, so we started working through one texture at a time. And, and that's also very Montessori aligned, just like a, a, introducing not a whole bunch of different textures, not like this crazy sensory bin with a lot of different things, but like literally it was one texture. And we started with like pasta, for example, because it wasn't squishy. It didn't stick to his hands. That's what we noticed he was avoiding. And so he could kind of play with it with his hands. Then we moved on to some smaller textures because we noticed that like sand, dirt, all of those things were another texture that he was averse to. So we introduced textures one at a time. If there was a texture that he was averse to, we would put it behind a Ziploc bag so he can explore it with like the visual, which we knew that he was seeking in the visual sense, but then he didn't have to touch it. And so it would, it was honoring him in his yeah. preferences until he became comfortable and wanted to peek inside the bag and feel it for himself. Um, he doesn't have I love that, that idea, Danielle. I think that's brilliant. I think that's such a great idea. I never thought of that before, but you're right, because if you are playing to the strengths where he's um, sensory seeking visually, then in his own time, when he's done enough of that exploration, he will then like go to open yeah. and, and that's great. And like we live, we lived in Florida, so we were right by the beach. We could never go to the beach. It was like the sand was too much. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't want to paint, things like that. Like he touches everything now. He's the one who got us all sick this time around just because. <laughs> um, but like we worked through it. It took over yes. a year. It took over a year. And, and I think that's something that, you know, us neurodiverse families just have to um, embrace. And, and, you know, it, it might not be everyone's experience, but it, it's going to be a lot of neurodiverse families experiences. It's just, it'll take us longer. If it happens for us, it's going to take longer. Um, and so we, that was one way that we introduced like the, the sensory element for him um, to kind of move past those aversions. Um, we also, because he, um, my son, since he is like sensory seeking, he needs to constantly be moving. So sitting down and working on something is, is very hard for him. Um, so we started with like puzzles or like matching cards or whatever and putting them in like a pasta sensory bin or a bean sensory bin and then he could get his sensory fix feel the textures like look for the different pieces of whatever we were going to work on or focus on for the day and he was able to focus better that way um, because he was getting some sensory needs met and you know he could take his movement break so that's um also a big part of like kind of tailoring our environment is we have a, a, several options. Um, we're fortunate enough to have the space to do it um, and to have weather to go outside, but we do um, try and make sure to get these like movements that he needs in order for his body to feel regulated. We do a lot of like obstacle courses, uh, which help to work on his executive functioning, like in between our shelf work. Um, and it's just kind of built into our work cycle in a sense. Um, and, and that's honoring his sensory needs, you know, not telling him, sit down, do this. Um, I know that he's like all children, right, Daniela? Like we have a very open, our environment for our work cycle is outdoor, indoor. So mm -hmm. you've always got that 
that you know that space for the kids to then have those movement breaks because all children need that output you know even if they're if they're not particularly sensory seeking or um sensory avoidance or anything like that they still need that time to have that movement or the freedom to kind of go in between the indoor outdoor and they're still learning a lot in their environment outside too. So I want people to listen, listening out there to know that having that time outside is actually adding to their child's development. For sure. For sure. And all kids need movement, you know, which is just why for, for me as, as a parent of a neurodivergent child, seeing goals made for him to sit for 15 minutes at a time, I'm like, it's hard for me to sit for 15 minutes at a time and they'll add with a non-preferred activity like (laughs) um and so that that's kind of where like you have to become your own expert too and be like well as an adult is this something I want to do then why are we doing this to our kids like we have to honor them they're they're capable human beings and we have to honor them as such you know um I would say that because because it's important to know our child's sensory profile, that too much of a certain movement and too much of a certain input can lead to sensory dysregulation, which can then lead to, um, which can then lead to sensory overload and um, overstimulation and a meltdown. So um, it's really important to be aware of that. And it's going to take a lot of trial and error. Like I know in some days it's not going to be the same as other days. Um, but it is very important to be aware of your child's sensory profile for this reason. Um, my uh, my son was going to a preschool for a bit. I pulled him out because of um, what was, was happening there in terms of sensory wise. Um, so his teacher noticed he likes to rip things. And so he's getting his fine motor in, but also like it, it gives him some proprioceptive input. So it is a sensory seeking. And she just started to give him like a bin of paper to just rip as much as he wanted. But he was doing so much of it repetitive day in and day out that he would come home and he'd be so dysregulated because that was the only input that he was getting. And so um, that's why I say like when we prepare our environments, we're also like following the child and being aware of their needs and we're observing, right? That's a huge part of the prepared adult is is observing and, and knowing how to observe your child for those signs and for those needs. And how would you, what are some of the signs like you just mentioned of a child who is maybe who is overwhelmed or how did you, did you record certain like patterns or things that were happening before the meltdown and, and what made you aware that that's what it was? Um, so it's definitely going to be different for every child. Um, I, I, started to notice certain patterns, um, mainly like, so my child does something that's called um, stimming and that's called like a self-stimulatory behavior. It's it's meant to help him like feel good and regulate, um, but there were certain stims that he was he would do before he would get dysregulated, before he would have a meltdown. Mm-hmm. And I could hear it in his vocalizations. He's still an emerging speaker right now. So for the most part, he um, he does not use words. He'll use other ways to communicate. And so he would make a repetitive sound with his like m- melodic sound um, before he was about to get dysregulated. And um, I started noticing that, for example. The other thing that I started noticing was a lot of chewing, a lot of extra chewing um, before he was about to um, have a meltdown. And like chewing things that he would normally not chew in a sense. And so I feel like a lot of parents might have this, this experience. I've, I've heard from a lot of people that like my child chews everything. My child wants to do this. Like we go through it. We offer choices. Like, you know, we, we hold our boundaries when it comes to that, but the excessive chewing was also a sign for me. So when there was a little bit like too much of a certain behavior happening, yeah. That was my clue. Okay, like we we need to figure out what kind of input. Um, And for us and for many kids, um, oftentimes it's vestibular input. So like swinging and not like like a very soft, like adult controlled, like kind of swinging slow back and forth. Um, 
sometimes would help. Sometimes you're past the point of catching it. You know, that's real life. Um, but, you know, uh, learning learning your child's sensory system will kind of give you it's, through trial and error for us. That's, that's what it was like, like a lot of um, slow movements in a single direction are actually a, a lot of calming movements for any child, but especially a child who is experiencing uh, sensory dysregulation. Yeah, we've got a um, we've got this gorgeous little swing chair in our calming corner in the preschool, and um, so in the calming corner we've got you know different charts with emotions and things. But it's a place where children can go, and it's a little egg chair. You know that I don't know if you guys have those, but yeah, it's just yeah. like an egg that sits on a swing, and you know it's really um, it's really helpful for some of the kids to you know to try and regulate their emotions or their sensory input too. Um, We did have a question that came through from Caroline and she said, love this. I love that you can tailor the three hour period based on the child's needs. My child also needs a lot of movement and adding it to our work period has helped with focus and emotional regulation so much. We build it into our shelf work too, such as the language scavenger hunt. Yeah, that's such a great one, um, Caroline. You know, that those are things that you can bring from outside to inside to really transition environments. Um, and that's really a huge part of Montessori and, and implementing that in the home as well. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, one thing I'll say like kind of related, um, I, I, I've seen this in a lot of like Montessori, Montessori-inspired spaces. Um some neurodivergent kids, um, in particular, like kids that might have my son's diagnosis, have a hard time recognizing other people's emotions and maybe identifying their own emotions in people's faces um, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And so um, I do think that that's a really important point to bring up is, you know, we can um, we can talk to them. I, I try. And when I when I see that my my son might be experiencing an emotion, I try and describe what it is that I'm seeing and try to name what I think it is and also model it myself whenever I'm experiencing something because I don't want him guessing because he might not be able to, he might not be able to actually like recognize that. Um, And so when we have these beautiful charts and and I have them too, like these beautiful charts and faces, like for him, he has a hard time recognizing those faces and and, um, what they might mean as it's tied to emotions. Um, So that's one way that I do try and support him it's just by naming. And that's something that, you know, is Montessori a line that work that I do for my two-year-old neurotypical child, right? Because I think it's just healthy for their own emotional regulation as well, but especially for, for um, my neurodivergent child. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that sometimes people might comment and say, well, you know, you're then telling your child what they're feeling. It's like, well, there's a difference between telling a child what they're feeling, but, but, or describing what you think that they are going through and naming emotions. So I think there's a fine line between that as well. Yes. And the words that we use matter. So like, I, I don't tell him like, you are frustrated. I say like, I'll describe and say like, I noticed that, you know, you threw this to the ground and you no longer want to put it away, um, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think you might be frustrated. Yeah, it looks like point. you might be. I sometimes get frustrated, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I do think that the way that we word things matter, like telling each other, you're mad, you're angry. Like, it's maybe, you know? Yeah, maybe. maybe I'm just tired, you know? Yeah. So mean that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, because a lot of the times when we do label feeling, I know I do that too. It's like, oh, you're so frustrated, you know, you threw the thing. Or, but, I mean, but it, they could be, they might not be. But, yeah, so I think rephrasing that and making sure that we're not assuming anything on behalf of the yeah. child but saying, like, I noticed, you know, you you know, you threw that across the room and you might be feeling frustrated would be a better way to phrase that. So that's a really great point. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me some of the, like, we've spoken about some of the benefits and the things that you've noticed in your environment that have really helped with your journey. What are some of the challenges that you found in implementing Montessori and how did you overcome them? I would say that my biggest challenge was, um, honestly, a lack of representation. Like I, I didn't see a lot of neurodiverse families that were openly sharing and practicing Montessori. And so um, it was difficult for me to know how to adapt or that I could and and still 
call it Montessori until I was like fully prepared, you know, like when I was first kind of learning about Montessori, I, I, I personally didn't see anyone. Now I do. Now that we have built this, like um, on Instagram, I've, I've kind of built a little community and connected with so many amazing people. And now I see like, wow, there, there are a lot of people like my family trying to practice Montessori at home or practicing Montessori at home or, or thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And um, that was my biggest hurdle was the lack of representation. Um, and especially here in the United States, um, we are, you know, persons of color and we're bi- biracial family, bicultural family, bilingual, like seeing all of our different layers and identities represented. Um, I think there's something beautiful about seeing all kinds of kids and especially like uh, kids of different abilities practicing Montessori. So not just neurodivergent, but like, you know, and so that, that's that been the power of building community, building an online community is meeting other families with kids that have different abilities than my own children and seeing how they're practicing Montessori and knowing that, yes, like you can practice Montessori um, at home and it's just going to look different. It's going to look different because your child's different than other people's kids. Um, so for me, that that is one big challenge. Um, I would say this: the second big challenge would be um, kind of making sense of therapy expectations and aligning that with Montessori principles. Yeah. Um, and kind of like getting therapists, like getting people on, your on team. board. Oh yeah. Knowing. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yes. yes, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we have children that say have, um, so in our Montessori preschool or even in the toddler program, we have parent, we have these discussions a lot and we do have a few neurodivergent children. And then I'll get reports from therapists and, you know, and supporting kind of educators and we'll be discussing like how we can align those goals. Uh, and I try and achieve them in a Montessori way or, you know, really try and ha- like have this open communication where we're talking to them and letting them know what it is that we're doing to help support the child. Because obviously the parents have that expectation then of, you know, oh, but, you know, in therapy we need to do this. So you need to do it in <laughs> in preschool too. And it's about having those open communications and letting them know that, we are achieving those goals and this is how we're going to do it and demonstrating that it can actually be done or achieved in a way that's also respecting the child and, you know, catering to whatever needs that they have as well. So, yeah, we have a question that's come through. What piece of advice would you give to a teacher who has a neurodivergent four-year-old in her class? She doesn't have a lot of experience with neurodivergent kids, but she's willing to learn. Well, that's Um, a big and yeah. it, it, it depends also um if that if you're listening out there um I'm there's just a nickname here but if you could let us know it's a little bit more about that child maybe where you know what kind of neurodiversity that they fall into what category because that's a big question Daniela yeah, for sure for sure I think um I think if they want to learn about that particular child that's in their class it's important to um build a strong connection with the family and be aware of, you know, what type of therapy support do they have? Um, what are those therapy goals? Um, what are the child specific um, sensory needs, what their profile might read? Um, because there are ways to, to kind of build that into a class. And so there are so like, I can just name some of the things that my four-year-old has some challenges with, and then maybe that might give, um, you know, some listeners some ideas of like, my, my four-year-old has motor planning challenges. And I know a lot of different neurodivergent kids, no matter what diagnosis, might have the same thing. And this means that um, doing like a multi-step, like even like dressing yourself, that requires so much motor planning because you have to sketch out all of the steps and then figure out the movements and yeah. coordinate the movements with like with both of your hands do possibly doing different things. Um, and that can be really challenging. And so my child needs to isolate movements what, step, step by step. So we're working on like little things step by step. Um, so he can't fully put on his sock yet, for example. So I started off and then he finished, like we're at the, p- the step where he can like 
pull it up halfway, for example. So that's like an, an adaptation that we're making at home. So does the child have motor planning challenges? If so, what kind of supports can the teacher give? My child might also struggle with executive function, which I mentioned earlier. So visual aids are perfect for that and for any child. Like that's just a universal approach that helps any child that lays out the steps for something that might lay out, hey, for, first we're going to do this, this, that, for the, their visual routine for the day, their choices that they might need to make might need to be visual. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so because because this child is autistic um, and because it is a spectrum and it's a wide spectrum, um, definitely I would um, – I would the visual consider. aids is a great one, Daniela, as well. like having that visual communication. Like I know in the classroom we have, you know, we, we might have like the steps like when they come in like to sit yes. down, take their shoes off and put their bag in their cubby and like we've kind of just visualized, we've made it into yeah. like a visual step-by-step, -step, which has really helped um, one of our children. So and and all the, uh, any yes. children. Like the thing that I find is that whenever we support neurodivergent children we also are supporting all children in yes. what we're doing yes it's not so someone in the Montessori world said that um those kind of things are watering down Montessori and I strongly disagree because I think that when you make or accessibility is watering down Montessori and it's I think not, it enhances it, to be because, honest. Because it helps every child, in all honesty. Like if you're making something accessible and you're making it inclusive for anyone rather than exclusive. And a lot of the support that our neurodivergent kids might, might get and might need can help everyone. It's just universal design for learning. It's just designing a classroom, designing a space that's good for yeah. every child. Um, so if, if this child is autistic and the teacher might not have experience with that, um, she definitely needs to be aware of sensory needs because, like I mentioned earlier, you don't want too much of a certain type of um, input because it might might lead to dysregulation for the child. And um, but like if we can avoid it, if we can support them with that and, and give them like choices so that they have a, like a well-rounded sensory uh, sensory support, that would be that would that would be a great place to start. Um, but definitely communicate with the parents, figure out what supports they have in place at home. What are some things that are working at home that the child might need in the classroom as well? Or, or like, how can you tailor it so that it, it is, um, it fits the classroom as well. You know, like the teacher's value system, the beliefs, because the teacher has to believe in whatever it is that they are implementing, Ultimately, it's still it's going to take consistency. Consistency, it's got to feel sustainable for the teacher as well. Because if if it's not consistent and it's not sustainable for the teacher or the child, like it's just going to lead to a breakdown um, in communication and support for the child. So, um, I would definitely start there. I, you have to build a strong connection with the, with that family. Absolutely. And I know, um, Danielle, you've got lots of information and things on your social media and we'll definitely put the links in here for everybody that's listening out there that wants to learn more about it um, as well because I know that you've got an amazing connection of, of colleagues and people that you might also have in your network that can help everyone listening out there that has um, neurodivergent children, whether it's them for their own families or for their teaching classrooms. Because like you said, a we really need to use these platforms like we are to raise awareness. Um, I know when I was doing my master's, I did a paper on Montessori and inclusive education and I was comparing what we have here in Australia, which is the inclusive education curriculum um, and Montessori. And I, what I found by doing that is that Montessori was so like tailored and made for all children yes. that that it really is an inclusive education style and curriculum. And yes, it looks different in every classroom or for, for, you know, for different children in your space, but it actually has all the support in there and the philosophy itself really, really does support all children. And that's what I love so much about it. Absolutely. Um, 
I know you touched on the role of parents and families, you know, in the Montessori approach specifically when it comes to supporting neurodivergent children. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Because I know, like you said about the communication between the families and the children, if they are in a preschool, like with, you know, with what we have implemented in our school, it is really important that we have that communication, not just with the families, but with the therapies and supporting, you know, yeah. um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, just from my own experience yeah. and yeah. Like, I hear, I, I get a lot of stories. I talk to a lot of um, like neurodiverse families trying to um, either try Montessori or Montessori schools. Like oftentimes like our children might be treated as a behavior problem. And so if the only time that an educator is talking to a parent um, is because they're a child's problem or having an issue, like that's not a solid foundation. And so um, we need to rethink how we talk about our neurodivergent kids' needs as well. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a really important thing for all educators and all therapists and, and everyone to, to kind of be aware of. Um, I know that here in the United States, and I'm not sure how it is in, in other parts of the world, um, oftentimes in Montessori schools, like therapists might not be allowed or there might not be some of that. Um, yeah, like there's not like a space for a therapist to come in and support. Um, and so I, I think that that would be a great place to start is to um, to do a, a true collaboration. Um, and then if we're being honest, like I, I know here in the U.S., like a lot of our teachers just don't have the proper support or time built into the day to plan. Yeah. And so it would be wonderful if like our, our schools created a space and a time, like, the, like time is the biggest crunch, you know, so that families can meet and communicate um, and and actually with with therapists with the teachers um, to kind of all get on the same page. Um, I know that our therapists, like most most therapists, offer to make the visual supports, offer to make these things, and so the teacher really just has to kind of work. Really, it'd be great to work alongside with a therapist to kind of bridge these supports. Um, and almost any therapist that you would ask would be happy to do that um, for a child to take to school or to have that support at school. So um, yeah, I do think that that would be a great place to begin. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here in Australia, we have the same issues when it comes to like the time, especially in early childhood. So we have ratios where the normal ratio in a preschool classroom is one to 11 kids in New South Wales in my state. So one teacher or one educator to 11 children. In our preschool, I've made the ratio pretty much three educators to 12 kids, which That's means that you've got... So, so having people that make decisions in early childhood to put more support on for staff so that we can work with children that are neurodivergent but also give that support to all children in our space and that educators feel supported and children feel supported it's just it's a decision that will really help and benefit everybody involved and like you said when you're talking to parents I would advise educators that are listening out there give them positive feedback about what the child is actually, you know, interested in what activities they're doing on before you bring up, you know, an incident that might have been, you know, they needing they needing a little bit more support on this, but, you know, I saw them do this this and this today and I was really excited because they, you know, they took that step further. So, mm. it's like balancing that and and not just focusing like you said on, you know, certain behaviors or things that are happening, but really giving them that feedback in a way that's going to be well received and so they feel like they're supported too because like I've had families that have said you know Sylvia like we're so lucky that we found you we're so grateful because we've been basically rejected from everywhere else like mainstream I'm talking about mainstream preschool because they can't support my child and because they you know they they don't really you know have the right support or they can't facilitate it and I'm just like that's that's really heartbreaking to yeah. hear that families are not being able to receive that support. Oh, for sure. And, and I think what you're talking about in terms of ratios is super important because um, like when we think about neurodiversity, we also have to acknowledge like giftedness 
as mm-hmm. neurodiverse, you know, as, as falling under the neurodiversity umbrella and, you know, um, our gifted kids repetition might not yeah. work for them. Like doing the same shelf work, like they need, they need more, they need, um, to switch it up every single day. And so like a teacher needs to be aware of that also, because when we, when we say neurodiversity or neurodivergent, oftentimes we're thinking like autism, ADHD, we forget about kids who are gifted and neurodivergent and yeah. their specific needs as well. And so that communicate, and, and, you know, when you might see like misbehaviors and so forth from gifted kids and it's because they're born. And so yeah. like, as, as, a, as a teacher, I oh, and as a parent now, I always look at my kids and I think, well, what could I have done differently? How could I have approached this situation or like this and then go to plan? What was my role in that? How was my response? How was my attitude? Mm-hmm. Like always looking to ourselves as the prepared adult, as the educator, rather than being quick to blame the kid, blaming their neurotype, their neurodiversity, whatever it is. Like what is within our control and what can we do differently? Like that's, it's really important as an educator and as a parent to, to view our kids that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how you included um, gifted children under the neurodivergent umbrella, because it's really common that maybe sometimes you might find a child that is, oh, wow, you know, oh, they, they're quite, you know, oh, they really are interested in maths or language or, and they're quite advanced and, you know, let's give them some more activities and stuff to do. But then, they might also struggle with emotional regulation or recognizing emotions in others. I've seen it in, you know, in a child that's come through our school and being aware or just looking for those kind of signs and and how you can really support them. So it comes back to observing the children and understanding their needs. Um, And there might be some children who do have maybe some sensory avoidance or sensory processing and, they might just be a neurotypically child that has those things as well. Yeah. So I think it's important to for people to take those observations and then if they do feel like there might be something else underlying it to speak to, you know, somebody else or medical professions or therapists to understand a little bit more about your particular child or, or if you're an okay. educator, you know, have that chat with families and then, you know, say, oh, well, I noticed this, this and this, you know, is there anything that you're noticing at home or just having that support or those open conversations is super important. Absolutely. Because I think that, I mean, I was going to ask about, you know, the next question we had was about, you know, how we collaborate with professionals and therapists to ensure a holistic approach. And I think I just touched on that to really support neurodivergent children, you know, in Montessori settings. Is there anything you wanted to mention on that? Um, It's just, I think first the hardest part might be finding the right team, you know, the right team of support. Um, I know here in the States, and it could be um, in Australia and so forth, there is an approach that seems to be the most aligned with Montessori principles, and it's called DIR floor time. And so that's one thing that I know when, um, like, we just moved. So I'm going to be looking for, like, a new occupational therapist in the area. And um, I'm going to be looking for someone that is DIR floor time trained and certified because that that is a child-led child like follow the child's lead approach um and what does that stand for Daniela the DIR just um, mentioned that again I'm not sure what it stands for I've just always known it's DIR floor time is the approach right um so they have parent courses as well so like if if you as a parent like these are the kind of things that I do like I I'll take courses um, mm-hmm. to kind of learn about an approach or to learn a little bit more because I'm with my child more than the therapist is. So I need to be able to support my child here at home when I'm not with a therapist yeah. and kind of carry over or, you know, ask better, more informed questions, you know, about my child. Um, but I love this approach because the therapist doesn't go in with their plan, their agenda, their pre-planned mm-hmm. activities. They kind of, they might have a few things that are of interest for the child and they kind of just literally wait, watch and wonder first before deciding how they're going to approach a session with the child. Yeah, and sure. so it's, it's like super Montessori aligned and um, I definitely recommend people look into it um, and see if there are people that can get on their team 
that that follow this approach because it is the most aligned with Montessori to give that whole child that holistic approach. Um, and if not, if it's not possible, because sometimes it isn't, um, you are the parent. Like I've learned that even with my therapist that I've had to stick with until I can find another therapist. Um, I set those limits for my child. One of them that a lot of a lot of therapists like to do with our, our kids that need a little bit more support, have higher support needs, is take their hand and force them to do stuff because they'll learn, not with their child. And that's something I've, I've told every single therapist, please don't touch my child. He does not react well to that. He, like, he needs to consent to that. And if he's not consenting to that, that's not how he's going to learn. Yeah. And I have to guide his hand slowly, guide his hand slowly and, and you know, teach him those movements that way. I yeah. think Caroline. Oh, yeah, Caroline just put up there, um, if anyone wants more information on DIR floor time, there's a great link. Thank you so much for popping Thank that up you. there. Um, yes, absolutely, boundaries, Daniela. Like no child should be grabbed by the hand and, and taken anywhere without their consent. It is just the basic rules of respect. Thank respecting you. the child and good on you for putting those boundaries in place and mm-hmm. and saying to you know to a therapist or you know that that doesn't align with how you know what we do and and how we think so sure. sometimes we feel like we can't like in the beginning I will say like at first like there's just so much information thrown your way when you're navigating a diagnosis when you're getting these pediatric therapies that like you don't even know if you're allowed to it's like yes you can this is your child <laughs> Like if they can't speak or like let someone know you're going to advocate on their behalf. If it if it does not feel good, if it does not align with your values, you say something. And if that therapist is not listening, I'm sorry, but it's time to find another therapist or mm-hmm. like just pause for a bit. Like it's better. And for me, it was better to pause certain therapies and wait to find another therapist and to continue with the therapist that was just not honoring those boundaries. Like I, I want my child respected. He deserves respect. Right. Yeah. And so um, I think that like starting there before we can um, kind of like bridge between like therapies and Montessori is like, you have to be very clear on your own values and what, what Montessori principles or whatever are important to you. Yeah. And set those boundaries with a therapist if, if for whatever reason, they're not aligning. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that so much. And that's some great advice um, to give, you know, parents as well who who are listening out there. And um, we did have a quick question coming through. I know we're going to wrap up the session really quickly. The time has just gone so quickly in this amazing conversation that we're having. Um, thank you for answering my previous question. And Daniela as well, you can always go back into this live and type in some comments to people. So specifically with this one, um, I have another follow-up question. What material courses would you recommend to school staff who want to start learning more about autism? I think this is a fantastic question. And neurodiversity in general, is there anything that you know of that we might not be aware of that would be helpful for people who did want to upskill or learn more about how to support children with autism? Um, So I think one of the most uh, impactful courses that I have taken is um, the Meaningful Speech course. So um, I believe she's on Instagram and has a website. If you search like Meaningful Speech, um, and the reason why is because it's it's geared towards speech, but it has different modules uh, from experts on um, and autistic voices themselves, which is super important um, on um, the way certain autistic kids might process events, for example, um, sensory processing. And so... Um, I think that the course does a really good job of uplifting autistic practitioners, um, which is super important, and giving you like a holistic picture of of the spectrum of what like autism um, is and what to expect. But the the course was particularly impactful to me because it changed the way that I approach speech at home and um, and kind of approached the way that I like talk to my child. And, and I've seen like, um, I, I speak to my youngest the same way. And, and, and that this, this is the beauty of learning um, about autism. And it's like what you said earlier, Sylvia, like whatever works for an autistic child, like any of those supports can 
it's not going to hurt a, a neurotypical kid, but if you don't meet the autistic child's needs, yeah. like it's just, it's not going to, like if you try and, and fit them into a neurotypical box, they're not going to get their needs met. So um, if you approach it from a way that honors autistic kids, like it's also the other kids are going to benefit from it. And I see it yeah. in my own household. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful course. Um, and there is one that she uh, recently released on uh, the augmentative and alternative communication, the AAC device um, that I have not taken yet, but I'm hoping to take because I want to learn how to better integrate that into, into the day. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Daniela. I know we're totally run out of time, but what advice would you give for everyone listening out there? If there's one piece of advice you could give them about Montessori and, you know, neurodivergent children, like, if they're thinking about considering it and they're not too sure if they're on the fence, like what would you say to those people? I would say um, that Montessori is probably the one philosophy that would honor your neurodivergent child that is going to help meet all of their needs, but you have to prepare yourself first. You're not going to change the environment. How do they give them a Montessori toy and they're going to automatically know what to do with it? Like you as the adult Prepare yourself first. Take some time. Evaluate your priorities. Learn. Read. Dive into Maria Montessori's work. Learn from other people who are practicing uh, Montessori with neurodivergent kids or, or kids of other abilities, right? It's important to, to see how others are putting this practice into place so that, A, you get ideas, but so that you can see, oh, I can, I can then do this for my child, right? And so, like, you have to start with yourself observe, reevaluate, and then decide if it's best for you and dive right in. That's incredible. Thanks so much for that advice for everyone out there that's listening. Daniela, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. So let everyone know where they can find you. After the broadcast is finished, we're going to pop all your links up everywhere. Any, um, you know, promotions or things that you want to talk about, projects that you're working on, because I know you do some amazing stuff in this space. Thank tell you. everyone about it. So I'm on Instagram um, at Montessori and Sensory. Um, I mainly just share a little bit about what our, our journey looks like. I'm there to answer questions, uh, connect you with the right resources if needed. Um, now that we're finally settling into this move, I'm hoping to get some like um, meetups for parents and like play play dates, meetups, um, because it takes a village. We need community support. We need to find the right system of support and good people in our corner. Um, so I'm hoping to start that up as well. So if you're in my neck of the woods in Georgia, and if not, maybe eventually we branch out and we uh, we create these meetups in other places as well. It'd be nice to do a, uh, a Zoom meetup. We'll do a, a global meetup. So for everyone oh, listening out there in our Facebook group, let us know if you have any questions about it. If you want to put up a post about neurodivergence and Montessori or, you know, where, where, wherever you are on your journey, I'm sure that Daniela or, and others will really help you with that journey. So don't be afraid to dive in there and try it. We've had an amazing discussion about Montessori, the method, and how it can really support neurodiverse children and benefit all children at the same that's time. Cool. And I think that's the beauty about it. Um, and I'm so thankful, Daniela, that with your lost voice and, your, and your, you've taken the time and you've lasted one hour of, um, you know, coming out here and talking to us about neurodiversity in Montessori. It's been such a pleasure to have you on our platform. Share this video. Everyone watching the replay, please hashtag replay. Let us know where you're listening in from. Any questions you do have, just pop them in the comments. We'll get back to you. Daniela will get back to you. And, um, yeah, we look forward to connecting with you again and we'll pop all of her socials on all our platforms. So thank you again, Daniela, for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. That's all right. Until next time, guys, take care and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.